The sun has gone down at Hangman's Hill, and the ghost at Misery Corner isn't walking tonight. So, welcome to the Weird Tales Radio Show, your weekly fix of ghost stories, urban myths, magic, and folklore. And now, here's your host, writer, award-winning journalist, best-selling author, and sometime werewolf hunter, Charles Christian. Hello and welcome. My name's Charles Christian and this is the latest episode of the Weird Tales Radio Show podcast, our first of the new year, 2019. That's uh, 18 months we've now been going. This is show number 47 and we'll be keeping along with our theme of Yuletide linked stories. I've also got Janie with me for some folklore. However, enough of that. Let's get on with the show. Right, it's winter. Time for huddling round log fires. Well, we used to do that, but we've actually got central heating and joined the <laughs> 20th century now here. <laughs> yes, well, we often used to have a log fire. I'm always a bit perplexed how some fires seem to do quite well and burn well and be warm uh, and last a while and some didn't. Well, it's because we didn't really know the folklore of logs. Logs, yes. And of course at one time it was fairly important that you did know which logs to burn and which logs weren't that burn. good. Mm-hmm. However, there yes. is a traditional poem that tells you everything you need to know about choosing the right firewood. Oh. Which could be helpful. Yes. Um, shall I? Yes, read it indeed. To you? Okay. Logs to burn, logs to burn, logs to save the coal a turn. Here's a word to make you wise when you hear the woodman's cries. Never heed his usual tale that he has good logs for sale. But read these lines and really learn the proper kind of logs to burn. Oak logs will warm you well if they're old and dry. Larch logs of pine will smell, but the sparks will fly. Mm-hmm. Beech logs for Christmas time, you logs heat well. Scotch logs, it is a crime for anyone to sell. Birch logs will burn too fast, chestnuts scarce at all. Hawthorn logs are good to last if you cut them in the fall. Holly logs will burn like wax. You should burn them green. Elm logs like smouldering flax, no flame to be seen. Pear logs and apple logs, they will scent your room. Cherry logs across the dogs smell like flowers in bloom. But ash logs, all smooth and grey, burn them green or old. Buy up all that come your way, they're worth their weight in gold. Yeah. There you go, ash folk. Get your ash yes. logs. And Scotch logs, I think, are not logs from Scotch logs, no, no, Scot- no. but they are... They're unseasoned conifer logs. And uh-huh. that's obviously because they do spit, yes. resin, and worse, they clog the chimney in tar. Yes. So you could get fires mm. in the chimney. Yep. Yeah, it's a good point. Good point. So, thank you. You're Another welcome. Handy, handy tip from you. And now you're off to do that seasonal Norfolk tradition of... Rubbing down with sandpaper an old door. Yes, I get all the good jobs, don't I? (laughs) (laughs) On you go. (laughs) Thank you and and goodbye. (laughs) Something wicked this way comes. Weird Harvest Press presents Harvest Hymns, the sweet fruits and twisted roots of folk horror. A two-volume set of books investigating the music of folk horror featuring contributions from some of the biggest names in the field. Candia McCormack, Johnny Trunk, Maddie Pryor, Sharon Krauss, Jim Jupp and Kemper Norton, to name just a few. Available now via lulu.com. 100% of all weird Harvest Press profits are donated to wildlife charities. Welcome. 
become fools. You have come of your own free will to the appointed place. It is time to keep your appointment with the Wicker Man. The Wicker Man. A few episodes ago on the Weird Tales radio show, we were talking about St. Cyprian, the informal patron saint of necromancers and magicians. And uh, we also talked about how um, in modern times, known as San Cipriano, in uh, Latin America and South America and the southern states of the United States, um, San Saint Cyprian is now very much a saint associated with hoodoo, root work and folk magic. And so this got me intrigued and I've been doing a little bit of reading up on folk magic and I found this rather intriguing spell. It's a container work and essentially it is a spell you would use if someone is giving you problems and you want to stop them being a nuisance, get them out of your life, um, stop them being able to harm you. Um, right, you're going to need a container to hold the target. I'll come to the target later. Uh, this is basically the person you're dealing with, your enemy, if you like. And um, the container can be something like a jam jar with a metal lid or a mason jar. Um, there is a suggestion that you could ideally use something that had contained vinegar or a bitter contents because you know you are doing something that is sour and unpleasant and dealing with someone and sour and unpleasant so you want um, to use a more acrid container whereas if you were practicing a love spell you might use something sweeter like a honey jar so you also need candles, or you can use tea lights. Um, you need a photograph of the target. This is the person you want to deal with to get out of your life or to generally um, stop pestering you. You need two nails. You need a lemon, a red pepper, four toothpicks, and dirt from the four corners of the crossroads. Um, so basically, not in the middle where you're going to get run over. Middle of the crossroads is not a safe place to be. So, so using a pencil that has no eraser, draw a big X over each of the target's eyes and then three X's across their mouth. And then petition St. Peter to stop the target from whatever they're doing that causes you trouble. So they, you know... St. Peter, I beg of thee, please take this person out of my life. Please stop him hurting me. You get the general gist. Now, take the two nails and turn the photograph upside down. And then run one nail through the photo going downwards and then the other nail from left to right through the photo. This is called nailing a target down. I think what they actually mean is you turn the photo so that the rear of the photo is facing up. So you score through the photo with the nail. Next, you cut a lemon in half and sprinkle red pepper on each side of the lemon and petition St. Peter to make the target's mouth burn as if on fire, if they even breathe your name. Then place the photo between the two pieces of lemon. This is the two pieces of lemon that have got the red pepper on them. I think, again, we're talking here of chilli peppers rather than capsicums, red peppers that you get in a greengrocer's in the UK, which aren't very spicy. And then you use the toothpicks to hold the lemon pieces together. So you basically skewer the photograph between the two pieces of lemon. Next, place the lemon 
and the photo in the jar. Cover it with more red pepper and then you add the crossroads dirt. Then you seal the jar. Once this jar is closed, you should never open it again. Shake the jar and call the target's name. Pray your petition after each calling. You will do this three times. So you shake the jar and then you say your petition. St. Peter, stop this person from hurting me ever again. And uh, this is called working the jar. Having done this, you're ready to place your candles in the arrangement. And you lay the candles out in the form of a cross. You cross yourself to do it. So um, you first of all lay the candles out top and bottom. So one candle at the top of the jar. So you've got the jar on a table or an altar. One candle at the equivalent of the top, but not on the actual lid of the jar. So one candle I suppose at the back of the jar, one candle at the front of the jar, and then the other two candles, one on the left, one on the right. And then the fifth candle actually goes on the lid. And then you light the candles in the same way. The one at the back first, the one at the front next, the one on the left, the one on the right, and then the one on the top. And as the candles are burning, you repeat your prayers again, at least three times. The next day, repeat the process, working the jar, shaking it, then adding the candles, repeating your petition to St. Peter again. Keep on doing this until the desired outcome you're looking for comes to pass. Then you can either keep the jar, perhaps bury it. One suggestion is, I've seen, that you bury it in a graveyard or at a crossroads. And um, an alternative is that you throw the jar into running water, it's a stream or the sea. And um, there you have it. That's the way to contain someone who's been hurting you, causing you grief. Just remember, they might be doing the same to you, though. If you want to grow your business, save time using the latest tech, and look great online, Weird Appeal Digital can help. We have a free, yes that's free, download listing 40 digital tools, apps and resources to help you grow your brand, promote your project, generate leads and reach your audience. Just go to www.appeal.digital slash weird tales for smart, effective digital design and your free download go to www.appeal.digital slash weird tales Right, let's go urban myth busting and the topic today is the Plowman's Lunch that well-known pub meal based on bread, cheese, onions and pickle. Although, depending on where you are, it can also now include ham, green salad, hard-boiled eggs, apple. Um, as my mother once said, that's not a ploughman's, that's a cheese salad. But I'm prompted to look at this because uh, certainly during my youth, when I'd be out and about and getting taken out by my parents, um, one of the features of the Christmas tide season was hunting for the perfect ploughman's lunch where we'd be out travelling around. Where would we get one? Now, we all thought this was a traditional English repast. However, I was reading a book recently which said it was all a myth and it was dreamed up in the 1960s by a cheese marketing organisation. So, true or false? Well, there is certainly an element that uh, the powers of marketing were involved and uh, the story is that it was after the Second World War, when there had been rationing and cheese and butter had been rationed, and the Brewers' Society, uh, working with the Cheese Bureau, 
uh, which exists for the admirable purpose of popularising cheese. And as a corollary, the public house lunch of beer, bread, cheese and pickle. Um, it had been popular before the war, but had been broken by rationing and the Cheese Bureau was campaigning to make it more popular. And indeed, along with the Cheese Bureau, uh, the Milk Marketing Board in the 60s also popularised the term the Ploughman's Lunch and the uh, major London advertising agency J. Walter Thompson, as they then were, uh, promoted it in pubs. So, was it all then just something relatively recent? Well, no, it turns not. Um, it goes way, way back in time. Uh, Sir Walter Scott, the famous Scottish author, he used the phrase Ploughman's Lunch and it crops up in uh, an 1837 book, The Memoirs of Sir Walter Scott. Uh, William Cobbett, writing some 20 years earlier, recalled how farmers going to market in Farnham often add tuppence worth of bread and cheese uh, to the pint of beer they drank at the inn stabling their horses. So we're now back there to the 1800s, but it goes back even further. And Pierce the Ploughman's Creed, which came out sometime round about the year 1394, mentions the traditional ploughman's meal of bread, cheese and beer. Bread and cheese, it should be noted, formed the basis of the diet of the English rural labourers for centuries. Basically, the cheese with a bit of lard and butter was their main source of fats and protein. And in the uh, absence of seasoning and modern pickles, onions and leeks were the form of seasoning. So, um, there we have it. Uh, oh, yes, there's another reference here. 1870s farm workers in Devon were said to eat bread and hard cheese at tuppence a pound with cider very washy and sour for their middale meal. Um, a rural labourer who sits on the ditch side with his bread and cheese and an onion has more enjoyment out of it than any Roman sophisticate, wrote Anthony Trollope in The Duke's Children. So, the Ploughman's Lunch. Myth busted, it's not an invention of the 1950s and 1960s by the advertising industry and the cheese marketing boards. It's a staple diet of the uh, English since at least the 14th century. Let's have another Christmas panto story. And this time we're looking at Cinderella. Now, you probably think you know the story of Cinderella, but there, there are several versions and twists in the story. Although, in fact, the first version of it dates way back to Greek times. And um, it's a peculiar little story, which involves a Greek courtesan called Rhodopis, who lived in a colony in Egypt. Um... Her name, apparently, Rhodopis, means rosy cheeks, as you say. She was a courtesan. And the story is that she was bathing one day when an eagle swept down and snatched one of her sandals from her maid and carried it far away to Memphis. That's not in Tennessee. That's the one in Egypt. And dropped it just as the king was walking by. The sandal landed on his lap and the king, to quote the story, stirred by the beautiful shape of the sandal and by the strangeness of the occurrence, then went and sought out the woman. And eventually he found her and married her and they all lived happily ever after. Uh, there are other versions of that story, and um, you can also find versions of it uh, relating in... Uh, there's one in China and there's one in Vietnam. But back to the main story. The first version of it in Europe uh, was written uh, by Gian Battista Basile in his book The Pentamarone, 
which was published in 1634 and was based in Naples, Italy. And uh, the heroine of that story was called Senatorola. And uh, this was, uh, the name comes from ash or cinder and the fact that servants and scullions were usually soiled with ash because they were doing cleaning work and lived in cold basements. The story more or less follows the traditional one. However, it was a few years later when a French writer called Charles Perrault in 1697 uh, came up with the story of Cendrillon. And this really is the basis of the modern day one, because uh, he, he included the pumpkin, the fairy godmother who comes to Cinderella's rescue and the glass slippers or crystal slippers. And um, the story there very much follows then the traditional one uh, where uh, she, uh, Cinderella, is the poor relation of the family and the wicked stepmother and her stepsisters go to the ball and Cinders calls up the fairy godmother who takes her there and the prince marries her and um, they all live happily ever after. Perrault said when he was writing it, without doubt it is a great advantage to have intelligence, courage, good breathing and common sense. However, there is a darker version of it, and this is the version of Cinderella from the Brothers Grimm. And it really is grim. They called it Aschenputtel. Their version in the 19th century is that the original gentleman's wife dies and she's a good little daughter to the family, but the father remarries and along comes the wicked stepmother and the wicked stepdaughters and they enjoy the good life while poor old Ashenputtel is stuck in the cellar doing the cleaning and being treated like a skivvy. Then comes the ball and uh, magically she is clothed in silver and gold and she goes to the feast. The prince dances with her and um, falls madly in love with her and then she goes looking for the owner of the missing slipper. This is where it gets grim though because when the uh, prince arrives and uh, the sisters are there, the wicked stepmother advises one of the sisters to cut off her toes so her foot will fit in the missing shoe. Um, but there was a sign given away there, which you think the prince might have spotted, uh, that blood drips from her foot. In fact, the prince is a little bit dense and it takes some doves floating by to draw his attention to it when they go, rookity-goo, rookity-goo, there's blood in the shoe, the shoe is too tight. The bride is not right. Um, undaunted, the prince comes back the next day and um, tries, meets the second of the stepsisters, the what we now call the ugly sisters, and uh, she chops her heel off so it fits in the shoe. And once again, the birds have to draw the attention of the prince to this uh, situation. Finally, he returns and the kitchen maid in the house, Ashen Poodle, or Cinderella, arrives. The prince recognises her as the stranger with whom he danced at the ball, and the shoe fits. Ah, and they all live happily ever after, and they marry. Well, not quite, because um, as she walks down the aisle with her stepsisters as her bridesmaids, the doves, remember the doves who've been giving the game away? The doves strike the two sisters' eyes, one in the left eye and the other in the right, leaving them blinded in those eyes. The wedding comes to an end. Clearly nobody's bothered about the uh, sisters with their blinded eyes. And as they walk outside, the doves fly in again and blind the sisters in their remaining good eyes. That's a punishment they have to endure for the rest of their lives. There is an interesting interpretation of the Cinderella story and that is how Cinderella begins the story as the daughter of a wealthy 
man. She's upper middle class girl with uh, good prospects and could marry her into a potentially upper class family with even more prospects. But once the mother dies and her father remarries, her position shifts and her marriage is no longer the primary focus of the family. Instead, it's finding grooms for the stepdaughters. So there you go. And of course, there is another explanation, which is all to do with the droit de seigneur and the fact that supposedly in uh, medieval times, the uh, powerful princes uh, were allowed to take the virginity of young women. And um, there is a version of the story where it's not a glass slipper, but a fur slipper. And um, use your imagination and you can work out the analogy of what the first slipper is and what the prince means when he says, aha, it fits. So there, there's another little cheery story. And just be grateful when you go to see a pantomime that it doesn't end with the two ugly sisters coming out with white sticks because they've been blinded by um, some rather vicious doves. And that's it. We're almost done for today. Thank you once again for joining us. Uh, that's me, Charles Christian and Janie here on the Weird Tales radio show podcast. We'll be back next week. Um, but until we go, here's a little piece of advice I found in a book I was reading about spells. And it's advice for men who wish to avoid a succubi uh, or succubus singular. You know what they are. Don't respond to sexual advances from solitary, beautiful, mysterious women who linger alone amidst ruins or cemeteries or near deserted freshwater springs. Well, I'd have never thought there was anything suspicious about that. There you go. Good advice. Stay well. Stay weird. Stay different. Black Shuck. The demon dog of East Anglia is baying at the moon. Which means it's time for us to go. You've been listening to The Weird Tales Radio Show with Charles Christian. Your weekly fix of ghost stories, urban myths, magic and folklore. Keep in touch with us online at www.urbanfantasist.com or by email at urbanfantasist.icloud.com or on Twitter at Christian Uncut. Good night. Join us again next week for another edition of the Weird Tales radio show. Oh.